Today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, really a very clinical take on what's been a, a fascinating uh, a day, uh, I think kind of converging uh, kind of a call for more individualized care for, for movement disorders uh, with uh, surgical treatments uh, as we go forward. So we all know that uh, the uh, FDA approved indication for movement disorder surgery really focuses largely on these three disorders, Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, uh, dystonia. And, and really, you know, my, my idea today is to talk about movement disorder syndromes, or you could say phenotypes, they're really interchangeable in the sense that I'm using them, and to understand more about these uh, as a clinical neurologist that, that focuses on following patients for years before movement disorder surgery, and also for years after with fairly frequent follow-up every few months or so, interchanging with other colleagues that have different ideas. We've kind of come up with a lot of, I think, things that you read in the literature already, but also uh, kind of are borne out in clinical practice. And I, my, my mentor, Jay Nutt, always used to say that the, the best uh, research questions come out of just everyday clinical care from patients. So I wanted to share these with you all and see what thoughts you might have to test this hypothesis of personalized movement disorder surgery kind of tailored to uh, the disease, but with a special focus on phenotype. Uh, and I think the talks today have really talked, gone a lot to speak about different versions or, or types of uh, uh, problems that we run into as patients have unique issues with these disorders to get the best outcomes. Well, really, as you see these people from uh, these people with movement disorders from their initial presentation all the way through advanced end stage uh, movement disorders uh, progression, there, there's lots of examples of how patients differ uh, beyond their personalities, which is one of the fun parts of the business, I think. But the, the disease itself, uh, seeing early onset uh, dystonia, leg dystonia, foot dystonia, and Parkinson's disease, uh, many of your young onset patients particularly will present this way. Uh, and then all the way to the uh, other stage of uh, Parkinson's advanced PD with uh, tremor burnout, which we see tremor burnout in advanced Parkinson's disease, not uncommonly with uh, stimulation off, even off medication, sometimes with optimization, with advanced uh, palliative uh, kind of DBS questions with stim off. We'll sometimes see, uh, you know, good improvement that uh, uh, gets worse with DBS turned off and then uh, uh, a lot of, uh, but, but no real tremor uh, coming out there. So you can tell that there's something dynamic about the disease. And then essential tremor of long duration kind of evolving or turning into Parkinson's disease, this levodopa responsive. And we won't get into that today, but you know, my feeling is kind of many of these people probably just have a very benign form of Parkinson's and kind of uh, develop more into the, the typical features. But th there really can be lots of changes. Not all patients have these changes. They uh, will, will, some will, will have very typical Parkinson's throughout the, the course. Um, so really, the, the thing that draws me to movement disorder surgery and the, the enjoy, enjoyment I derive from working with this is uh, the, the ability to use neuromodulation, particularly with DBS, to uh, evoke changes uh, at the moment, you know, when you initially turn the patient on and optimize them, it's really a very wonderful thing. But, but also, uh, it really, uh, uh, the ability to, to work hard, and it is incredibly challenging, uh, to reprogram these patients and, and adjust things along the, the course of the disease. In some cases, radical reprogramming to, to get major responses to the phenotypic evolution of advanced movement disorders. And so the kind of the typical Parkinson syndromes, uh, in my mind, two different. There's the tremor dominant responsive to levodopa, and uh, also akinetic hypokinetic responsive to levodopa as well. And, and even within these common syndromes, you see uh, phenotypic variation uh, between these groups uh, with different clinical outcomes. We know that the akinetic, hypokinetic versions have uh, earlier uh, progression to dementia, more non-motor symptoms, it seems, REM sleep behavior disorder, whereas the tremor dominant form has uh, uh, more of a benign course, somewhat slower progression, perhaps even the notion of tremor being a marker for a uh, compensatory, healthier uh, uh, striatal system uh, in the face of neurodegeneration. You know, I think it's an interesting, you know, kind of de novo biomarker that may follow, as we see over the previous talk, spoke about a lot of the differences there. Now, what, what I really spend a lot of my time on are these less common Parkinson's uh, motor syndromes, particularly. And uh, some of these are a bit of a takeoff on uh, akinetic, hypokinetic, for example. Uh, this is often lumped into this postural instability gait dysfunction subtype. Uh, there, there really is a, a clearly a big difference between people without tremor who have, you know, slowly progressive Parkinson's and those that, that do progress somewhat more quickly but still have levodopa response to Parkinson's disease. Strongly lateralized Parkinson's disease, or what I would call hemi-Parkinsonism. Uh, tremor refractory to, uh, relatively refractory to medication. 
uh, medicine responsive PD with dyskinesia at extremely low doses. And then PD, which this really isn't a syndromic variation, but it's uh, uh, the unique physiology of the patient may make medication uh, intolerance an issue, and so having to address that. And then the, the non-PD tremor syndromes, and I've went ahead and lumped essential tremor in there. I, I think essential tremor is, is, uh, is, it is both underdiagnosed, and then when it's diagnosed, it's often not really essential tremor. So there's that unfortunate combination of, of other tremor disorders lumped into essential tremor, and that in of itself, essential tremor is underdiagnosed. So we'll talk a little bit about that, and this is still some background information, but really the idea is, you know, why consider movement disorder phenotypes before surgery? I mean, I, you know, a lot of our our patients uh, come from uh, general neurologists to do, you know, really, I think, a good job evaluating, and we'll send them into surgery, have good results, and, and come back and, and, and do okay for a while, maybe a year or two, and then they have more issues, and then typically they'll present to our clinic or the other tertiary care movement disorder practices where you, you kind of have to, to deal with the, uh, the, the evolution of the disease or, or, you know, why the leads were placed in a certain location at a certain time, maybe what expectations are. And, and so that's, you know, I, I think really important to try to address some of these specific issues with patients and individualize the care. Well, and we know that the pivotal trials really are, have shown again and again good outcomes regardless of, of lead location for Parkinson's, GPI versus F STN. So, you know, really, I mean, in the bird's eye view, shouldn't we just let the surgeon pick or, you know, perhaps uh, confirm the diagnosis that's Parkinson's versus essential tremor and, and, and kind of go from there based on whatever the surgical considerations would be? Well, we're really, uh, we're, we're in the world of anecdote here. Uh, there is no good evidence, but a lot of anecdotal opinion uh, uh, guides us to, to suggest that, that we really should think long and hard about the presentation of a movement disorder, Parkinson's disease, or uh, tr essential tremor, looking for unusual features and thinking about the long-term consequences of lead location and uh, timing and other aspects uh, of, of, of movement disorder surgery. I'm just going to go over this quickly because this has been uh, covered pretty heavily, very basic information. Uh, typical Parkinson's, STN, DBS, uh, the advantages, of course, being medication reduction and uh, very good control of tremor, uh, uh, bradykinesia rigidity as well. Uh, and also uh, the, uh, the lowering the levodopa dose, of course, is a really, uh, I think, a valuable thing that patients uh, value quite a lot. But, but there are negatives. Uh, Medication-induced dyskinesia can be a problem if patients do not at the time, but perhaps in the future, have a, a need for higher levodopa dose. It can make it quite hard as the movement disorders neurologist to manage these patients with STN leads. Uh, and uh, you have to kind of kind of worry about that a bit. And also non-motor symptoms may emerge, and if they're not carefully recognized, the lowering of levodopa dose can, can uh, cause a lot of problems with quality of life for these patients. And then I think one of the big thing that's, uh, one of the big items that's been glossed over a bit, it's been studied in, in many of the, the um, uh, trials, but with really very advanced Parkinson's, uh, gait changes can occur with, uh, um, this can sometimes paradoxically worsen with higher levodopa dose, but, but certainly with lowering of the levodopa dose, you may see improvement in the, the, the more cosmetic aspects of Parkinson's being tremor. Um, with bradykinesia and, and gait worsening with the, the lowering of levodopa doses uh, or wearing off. And then, of course, some of the cognitive risk. And then GPI, which has uh, really seen, a, I think, a, a, you know, a large turnaround in terms of uh, use. And, and there are centers doing a lot more GPI now in the past. But, but there's unique upsides and downsides to that. Uh, there's really, except for a, a few groups around the country, uh, a limited experience with unilateral GPI in Parkinson's disease. Some notion, and Jamie, my colleague, wanted me to emphasize how much time she spends, uh, she spends on our patients where I really strongly prefer GPI uh, to, uh, to, to control their tremor uh, in GPI patients. So I'd be remiss to not uh, acknowledge her, her work there uh, and, and stress that point. Um, but uh, the, the other thing is if patients aren't reducing medication, I think particularly as, as surgeons, you, know, you have a really wonderful ability to do this procedure and, and see this result with patients. And, and they, they, they sometimes, if they tell you they don't reduce their dose, their medication dose, somehow it was less successful. In, in my view, I think in the, in the long scope of Parkinson's reduction of medication dose as it pertains to lessening side effects, I think is very important. But as, a, as a, a, an end of itself, I, I think that, that it, it perhaps is a little overemphasized uh, when it comes to long-term well-being and quality of life for some of these patients. Okay, so now onto the specifics. So this uh, hemi-Parkinsonism, uh, this is a really just a, a strongly lateralized 
uh, tremor dominant, almost always tremor dominant uh, Parkinson's disease with uh, often bilateral rigidity and, and bradykinesia as well with careful examination from Ott's maneuver and, and, and observation of gait. Uh, you can really see that there are uh, more generalized symptoms, and, and, I, and I've you know not not being a surgeon, but kind of thinking for my surgeon, trying to trying to think ahead what what they might have to encounter. I would think that you know the unilateral now to treat current symptoms versus uh, bilateral now uh, to uh, 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 treat both uh, sides as symptoms of all that may be something. I know surgeons think a lot about that because they see patients for repeat. Uh, procedures down the road and, and have to contend with, you know, maybe we should have just done it earlier, perhaps when they had lower cognitive risk, lower medical risk. So some factors that we've seen uh, affect patient decision there, their patient preference to go ahead and have the surgery completed at that time with both sides uh, done, cost. Uh, we're seeing more and more now that, you know, there, there's been changes in pay structure for that. And, and really, one of the big factors is how strong is the asymmetry or is gait or cognition affected? Those are some uh, items as well to consider. They're, they're, they're different things. The asymmetry really more for the therapeutic use of the surgery and then safety for gait or cognition, um, having some, some slight abnormalities there that perhaps might worsen with surgery. We, we might consider uh, uh, lateralized with a hemi-Parkinson patient. In these cases, I, I, I've really almost always seen, um, and I think this isn't exclusive, but, but most places I've, I've uh, encountered uh, STN is often chosen due to the presence of tremor. And the big problem with this, of course, is uh, what to do with progression of the disease and, and worsening of the disease. You may have dyskinesia, and, and it might respond to lowering dose of, or to lowering the voltage of the DBS uh, device, but uh, you, you can have some real problems controlling it or dy dystonia on dystonia uh, on the stem-treated side. And then may the unilateral side perhaps show increased symptoms if you do lower the medication dose. That's, that's really the big unknown. And, and sometimes with some of these patients uh, with, with Hemi Parkinson's, they're often quite healthy uh, in, in terms of their mobility. And, uh, and, and you sometimes have to really lower the dose for some time. There's this notion of the long duration response to levodopa and, and a washout of several hours is, is, is uh, often very inadequate to see a true off response. So we've sometimes brought our patients back after several days off medication, in which case their tremor uh, significantly worse, but their gait or bradykinesia uh, may have uh, uh, more prolonged latency for, for washout for symptomatic emergence. So uh, that, that's really uh, some things to think about there with hemi-Parkinsonism. Uh, the, uh, really what we see is the uh, electrode that's contralateral to the most affected side in, in most cases of DBS really derives the large, largest portion of motor benefit. And in, in, in unilateral cases, this can last up to a year or longer. Um, one of the uh, groups here, this was uh, uh, the UAB group, uh, looked at uh, 82 consecutive patients. This is a, a center where they've done you know, a lot of unilateral uh, DBS work, and 82 consecutive patients receiving unilateral and followed up for two years to determine if they had contralateral. And you know, 28 of these had contralateral placed in two years, and, and that's really you know, a fairly, uh, fairly small group. Now, they didn't uh, divide these up into the this, this phenotypes that I've mentioned, but there's not a lot of uh, published data out there. Uh, about this outside of some of the individual centers work and, and three of the factors here the uh, symmetry uh, the severity of the tremor and the the body weight which may be a artifact of tremor and, and kind of the increased me metabolism there were really some of the big markers that favored uh, uh, bilateral subthalamic DBS at uh, post-op versus uh, uh, or unilateral versus uh, bilateral so the compare cohort was a, an interesting group uh, where ultimately 44 patients had GPI versus STN and then they offered a second site at six months and uh, only 48% of those patients elected to defer surgery. So three and a half years uh, treatment duration, uh, they, there were uh, still a significant amount of patients receiving unilateral. And interestingly, I mentioned GPI earlier, and I really don't have a lot of personal experience with unilateral GPI, but 60% of those had the GPI target, and I found that really very, very interesting. Um, the uh, STN alternately had probably five and a half times li uh, higher likelihood of bilateral surgery and the asymmetry of the disease strongly influenced the idea of the second site. I think you can make an argument that maybe, you know, the STN patients, perhaps they had different syndromes. Maybe this is a kind of a surgical self-selection in a way for different syndromes. But there's not been really a lot of work done on, on different phenotyp uh, phenotypic variation and, and kind of deciding how to handle that uh, surgically. Then the benign tremulous Parkinsonism, which I think still may have an, an ICD-10 code, uh, along with many other things. So, so these are the patients that we see where, you know, if leave it up to one to two grams a day, doesn't suppress tremor. I start talking to them very early on about DBS. 
And, and unlike other, other motor features, uh, tremor may persist with uh, little, little or no change with, uh, with other uh, uh, symptoms. Um, you know, you may see off and on variations that uh, you, the Jupiter S may be driven significantly by uh, fluctuations in, in gait and mobility, but, but tremor really uh, is, is still a, a big part of, of, of uh, maybe while the score doesn't change in other ways or, or, you know, it's just something definitely to monitor and one of the reasons to do uh, Jupiter S and look at those subscores uh, carefully. And then one of the other curious things that I, I don't know if others have seen this, I think, you know, I've seen it enough, it's probably not that uncommon, but you can have dyskinesia in the, uh, in the state where, or dyskinesia in the on state as well as tremor in the on state. And I almost always see uh, tremor resolve in the on state, but in, in some of these cases of really refractory uh, uh, Parkinson's uh, tremor, uh, they uh, will have the presence, the coexistence of dyskinesia and tremor, and it, it makes me think I'm, I'm losing my mind sometimes to, to see both of these things because it kind of I have some rigidity about my thinking, I guess, and expect to see tremor go away when I when I see dyskinesia. So, so here I, I kind of would thinking was the surgeon gonna wonder has the neurologist been managing the patient correctly? Why do they still have tremor? Perhaps there's something that's not being done. Uh, are they really ready for surgery? Well, fortunately, DBS works so well for tremor. If uh, a surgeon see a, sees a patient who otherwise is responding to uh, uh, medication and there's breakthrough tremor, it's not really a much of an argument at all. Uh, they usually are very enthusiastic to uh, to do DBS in, in these cases, and and we really see that uh, uh, STN site selection is is really very uh, effective to treat uh, tremor refractory to levodopa. So I think in terms of site selection there, even though we've seen that unilateral GPI, uh, you know, does have uh, really quite quite good re results in some of the long-term studies, uh, it, it, it almost always, in, in, in my experience, has ended up being an STN location. And then there's this postural instabil instability gait dysfunction subtype, which, which is, in my mind, it's an opinion, but I think it's erroneously uh, equated with akinetic Parkinson's. They're not the same. Uh, if you see a lot of patients, uh, you, you really uh, uh, can see akinetic uh, rigid Parkinson's patients that have qu quite good gait for a long time, have no tremor. And, uh, and then there are the early fallers that, that, that have response to levodopa. We don't have autopsy, but they, they have no other really strong signs of atypical disorders. Um, and, and so these, these, I think, are very challenging and probably the patients I worry the most about in terms of their phenotype and, and deep brain stimulation. I mean, of course, always in the back of my mind is the diagnosis correct, but there's other aspects as well. Um, so uh, the akinetic uh, PD subtypes also have more non-motor symptoms and cognitive problems. Uh, they're just a, a messier biology altogether. And so, of course, the first question that I mentioned was, is this atypical Parkinson? Um, the other big one is, will the outcome meet the expectation? And Jamie and I were just discussing a few cases uh, where uh, we brought these patients in and they actually had 30 to 40 percent improvement in their Jupiter S motor scores. But, you know, the, the, what they really wanted to improve was their gait. And I'm sure everyone's seen this. You know, this is not that uncommon. And uh, that's, a, that's a tough position to be in. Uh, you, you know, you, you really think that patient probably is not going to be happy after DBS. And I really tr try to not overly encourage uh, movement disorder surgery for, for patients where there's levodopa responsiveness, but, but not a lot of responsiveness and gait, and that seems to be a priority for them. And in these situations, really what we've employed is uh, our, our careful uh, discussion with DBS committee, filming, examination of the uh, patient uh, uh, before and after uh, on off testing. And, and we've even gone so far as, and Jamie's been quite good about this, about written expectations uh, documented to uh, give to the patient and the family so it's quite clear uh, what some of the, the potential barriers to uh, successful surgery as it regards outcome would be. So, you know, uh, these patients, I've, I've kind of uh, really get on my surgeon a lot about, you know, GPI, GPI, oh, well, you know, and, and finally until I, they, he caves and uh, uh, often doing more GPI for these patients. And I think we'll, I'll show you one of these slides in a minute, uh, supporting some of the importance of, of or at least the tol good tolerability for GPI and gait. Uh, and also thinking about the future, I mean, I own these patients unless they run kicking and screaming to the nearest competing facility, which happens. Um, but uh, I, I'm thinking about them years down the road. They're, they're likely going to require a higher levodopa dose. And so having the GPI lead in place is, is, is sort of like a, a 401k. You know, it's like painful at the time, but down the road, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pay off. And, and I, I, I don't go into that detail with them, but, but I do kind of let them know that there's immediate benefits and then that the long-term benefits that aren't often discussed. 
going to slip, skip this for the interest of time. Um, so, so uh, this is the uh, this is uh, groups here where there was tremor dominant. We can't really see it well, but uh, and, and, and intermediate and posture instability gait dysfunction subtype here. And really, what they found was uh, this is uh, Maya Katz, the group at UCSF. Uh, the, the PIGD uh, was less responsive to, to any stimulation than tremor dominant or the, the intermediate group. I mean, they had good, good results with stimulation. Uh, there was no really major difference in the major outcomes based on the motor subtype. But the tremor dominant group actually had, a, had a, a more of an improvement in, in gait subscores uh, with GPI. And there's a lot of reasons for, for this. It, it, in my opinion, I think one of the things that, that sometimes can, can drive worsening of gait and it may not always come to the surface because it's very hard to monitor gait uh, is the lowering of the levodopa dose with STN. I think that that can really be a, a big problem that I've seen with patients. And when you have STN leads in place, it's often very ha uh, hard to get them to tolerate higher levodopa doses. Or you have to work very hard to, uh, to decrease whatever you're doing with the stem to, to decrease the tendency of stim-induced dyskinesia to get them to tolerate the benefits of levodopa for gait. And then Parkinson's disease with dyskinesia at a low dose. Uh, the, these almost always, well, not exclusively, but almost always are your young onset uh, folks with uh, dyskinesia early. Uh, they're very exquisitely medication responsive, but half, uh, 100 milligrams or 50 milligrams may trigger a, a full-on response. And, and this shortened duration, higher frequency levodopa dose uh, as a consequence of de de degeneration can really, you know, make some great DBS candidates, but, but, but uh, you know, horrible in terms of uh, medication tolerance. So, you know, really, it's kind of a win-win here, but uh, I mean, my take on this is how do you win the most? You know, how do you get the, the biggest uh, immediate benefit and also long-term benefit for the patients? And uh, young onset people live a, a long time. Life expectancy is, is less than, than average uh, without Parkinson's, but it's actually getting closer and closer, it seems, to, to typical life expectancy, at least of what it used to be. Um, so, uh, you know, we have to think about these patients 10, 15 years out. I mean, we've got a, still a 1997 patient, a uh, tremor patient floating around. But I think about Parkinson's, hoping to see more and more of those patients a decade or more down the road, followed up with DBS. So uh, particular things that we've noticed with these patients, uh, 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 STN-related uh, toe walking dystonia, for example. We've seen, we've seen a number of those, uh, uh, toe walkers, young men. Uh, often when the disorder starts progressing over uh, a, a decade or two and then developing uh, toe walking dystonia, limb dystonia. Uh, you see it in, in advanced uh, Parkinson's and, and older people with striatal hand and, and other uh, uh, features, but it really is, I think, a pretty pretty specific problem to, to young onset patients. And then when they, with it's not completely clear, but I think STEM may have a, some kind of triggering factor to this. And, and the problem with this is that it may not be obvious initially. So you may not see this within four years. You know, we now have an earlier indication for, for DBS and, and, uh, or even five years, which was the, the traditional kind of waiting period to look for atypical disorders to come out. But I think one of the advantages that we may be losing with uh, going to earlier uh, DBS for movement disorder Parkinson's patients is really to see the, the full spectrum of their disorder emerge and, and bloom, if you will. And, and uh, there's a lot to think about there, and uh, particularly when it comes to using STN versus GPI, seeing these young onset people. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a lot more than tremor dyskinesia, uh, you know, and, and just wearing off. I mean, watching gait and all these other features are just huge, huge parts of it. Uh, this really, again, isn't the, the degenerative uh, uh, kind of subtype or phenotype here, but anorexia and nausea are common side effects of Parkinson's medication, and sometimes it's severe. Um, I, I'm, I'm, even though I'm a primarily a clinical pharmacologist when it comes to the research work that I do, I mean, I'm a pretty, pretty big advocate for early DBS if a person's tried a number of... Uh, of therapeutic medications and uh, a lot of side effects, nausea, orthostatic hypotension, things like that. I and I think that they might be a, a great DBS candidate. I I really strongly strongly counsel them to to uh, consider that because of the uh, the time spent uh, time of their life spent otherwise suffering from Parkinson's symptoms that they could get good benefit while we're just hemming and hawing. A neurologist and surgeons know neurologists never hem and haw about medication, but uh, you know we're kind of hemming and hawing about micro adjustments of doses and trying this and trying that getting prior authorizations. I mean, th this takes, you know, they can go through this cycle for years. So, you know, and uh, one other big thing is that uh, th this, uh, this obsession with uh, orthostatic hypotension, I mean, I, you know, it's a, a great uh, way to detect uh, multiple system atrophy, great way to detect uh, atypical Parkinson's disease. But, you know, there are true idiopathic PD patients that have orthostatic hypotension as well. It's often not as severe. It, it usually doesn't result in falling. They usually don't have frequent falls. 
uh, and it's very readily treatable nowadays. But, but this can actually be driven by high doses of levodopa that we are otherwise using to try to cross the motor threshold uh, from uh, 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 levodopa use, which can be variable, highly variable between different patients. So you have to consider this. I mean, I would think uh, uh, some inkling of levodopa responsiveness or otherwise patients looking very typical for, for a surgery like DBS, which nowadays are, is, is really very safe and effective. You know, I, I would, I would, you know, rather take the the small risk there of, of some issue rather than let them, you know, live with uh, uh, medication induced uh, worsening of neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. So, and uh, here uh, there were there was a, a, s a small study done looking at five subjects with presumed IPD uh, and medication intolerance due to nausea that were matched to five L-dopa responsive IPD patients uh, matched for age, disease duration. Uh, pre-surgical severity and sex, and really found that both groups did well. So these are people that didn't, they weren't really levodopa responsive because they didn't have a chance to be. And, and that's a very important point when you're selecting patients is to, you know, just not, not were they levodopa responsive or not, but if they weren't levodopa responsive, was there, was there a reason for that? Was it because they just couldn't tolerate it? And this is why we're talking about levodopa intolerance here. And these were followed out for about 12 months. Okay, I think I'm okay on time still, a little bit? Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, VIM uh, for tremor, that's it. That's all I really need to talk about in this slide, right? It's pretty, pretty clear. That's it's been covered well today. 20% um, uh, of patients uh, with essential tremor may have a form of dystonia, and I'll just throw that out there. I think most of us have seen dystonic tremor and realize that can be a feature. But this is where it gets to the point of essential tremor is a very uh, uh, interesting disorder. It's so common, uh, but it's commonly uh, underdiagnosed. And when it is diagnosed, it's, it's I think, frequently misdiagnosed. And I'm probably a little bit biased because I, I see the referrals after the initial neurologist, the general neurologist has seen the patient. But the idea that patients with dystonia, particularly cervical dystonia, are commonly misdiagnosed with essential tremor, it, it's a real problem. And, and these patients go to, to DBS surgery frequently with a, a diagnosis of essential tremor. No question of that still on the chart. Uh, so one thing just to throw out there, uh, this is uh, something that John Hammerstad, one of my other mentors, kind of ha hammered in over and over again, and I, I found it to be so true, is that isolated head tremor is cervical dystonia until proven otherwise. And so I, I just, you know, when you get that, that discussion uh, uh, with, with the neurologist, you know, and, and they're talking, referring neurologists, and they're talking about, you know, how about this head tremor? with this patient with essential tremor and DBS, I'm like, well, let's take a look, you know, let's, let's take a, let me have a little look at them and, and see, you know, what other factors may be going on. And, and, and it's all, you, it's just always cervical dystonia. I don't think I've, I've really ever been convinced I've seen isolated head tremor uh, caused by essential tremor. And then essential tremor, you know, in my mind, and the, the typical sense is a bilateral hand tremor at its greatest. Uh, with a uh, voice, uh, some head tremor as well uh, for some patients uh, and uh, uh, jaw tremor also. So, so really just at least, and it doesn't mean that, 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 you know, by knowing this and at least looking at it, that you're going to get it right. I mean, I, I, it's hard. It's hard to get it uh, uh, right, I think, all the time. Um, does it matter? Does it matter? I mean, this is, you know, at this point, usually in the discussion at our DBS case conference, I've triggered a small seizure in our neurosurgeon, and he just starts saying randomly, VIM, 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 you know, and, and we're talking about... You know, maybe other other possible causes should we do Botox and other things like that? Because frankly, you know that that for severe tremor uh, of you know many types of EM really is going to be very very effective. And so there were some great uh, discussions today already. Wonderful talk about um, MS tremor and, uh, and and Holmes tremor, which and, and for the purposes of, of my talk, I've kind of uh, lumped MS tremor into a Holmes tremor. And, and I really feel that, that this probably fits with uh, the, any kind of tremor where there's lesion. Uh, present and basal ganglia, uh, cerebellum, brainstem, those are all structures that, you know, have, you know, even, even uh, low bar aspects of the, the brain, uh, there is connection to uh, motor control systems. And uh, the, these patients often look different. There's often a proximal tremor originating uh, for the Holmes tremor patients. Um, there can be both, but uh, often proximal compared to essential tremor where it's more of a distal origin. And uh, th these proximal tremor patients, you, you've, if you've operated on even a few of them, you, you know that, that DBS, it works great in your mind. I mean, it, they look better. It works great. But to the patient, you see, you know, that they'll come back and they still have moderate tremor. And I would say that 60, 70 percent improvement of tremor is statistically it, it's good. I mean, I, I think it's a very, it would be kind of positive. I would set that, that bar at the, above the positive level for a response. But, but for patients, you know, what 
percentage of tremor uh, improvement is clinically meaningful. And we know at least with UPDRS, uh, you know, five points is a clinically meaningful change or something like that for the, for the motor sore. But for, for tremor, I think it's a completely different situation and knowing what is clinically meaningful, particularly when we're talking about off-label use of, of DBS for other types of tremor, it's, it's, uh, it's really hard. And I think at the, we're all in a, in a difficult situation trying to predict uh, how patients without typical tremor syndromes like the Holmes tremor will uh, respond to DBS. So, you know, setting expectation about long-term success of DBS is, is, a, is a hard thing. Um, you know, this MS-related uh, Holmes tremor, in, in my experience, I've probably seen more, more patients with this uh, than, than any other cause uh, that I've seen for Holmes tremor, other than like tumors and things like that, stroke. Uh, it may be more responsive, uh, but uh, the underlying limb dysmetria uh, can be a, a big problem. And you can't, you, I, I just, I'm not convinced how you could test for that uh, before uh, doing surgery on these patients to, to know if, you know, they would have a lot of ataxia and still have poor functional outcome. And I think you saw some discordance in the earlier slides between function and tremor improvement. I mean, again, I, I think it's great, and that's why we videotape them, trying to convince the patients that they've gotten better. They usually don't argue, but, like, but I still can't, you know, I still can't do that. <clears throat> so uh, th there is a really great article that uh, I, I pulled a lot of this from, kind of a meta-analysis, but I kind of had to analyze the data. It wasn't organized, um, that, that Mike Oaken, and I think his former fellow, did uh, uh, work on recently, just put out, and take, take a look at it, and, and they cited some other sources as well, but... Uh, looked at uh, Holmes tremor and other types of, you know, non-essential tremor syndromes. Uh, you know, really one of the interesting ideas is this notion of, uh, I think, personalized DBS surgery, personalized movement disorder surgery, and uh, uh, looking at different sites. So, you know, it's one thing to have uh, feedback systems and, and whatnot, but but they have to be in the right location, the right real estate in order to, for the even, even I think, closed looped and other systems to work well. And this notion of multiple tremor generators, I, I think, is fascinating because, the, the, these patients that we, we do DBS on that have these atypical syndromes, you really, you really do see some pretty awesome improvement in their tremor, but it's like there's just other tremor you just can't get at. It really almost is like the electrodes not covering it all. So the idea of uh, multiple tremor generators might require multiple leads. You know, just put more in. It's easy, right? It's easy for me to say. And, and these are some uh, uh, sites that have been reported. Uh, this all, you know, case reports, uh, VLVA, VM, at plus STN. Um, the post subthalamic area and VIM, you know, combos uh, in patients, and and of course, they're all all reported studies have positive outcomes, so they're all positive <laughs> outcomes. Um, and one of the things that uh, that I've really been interested in is, uh, and more recently, is using um, uh, surface EMG, looking at psychogenic tremor uh, versus uh, you know true tremor. It doesn't happen very often, but we've had a few cases of that. And I think multi-channel surface EMG, at least trying to to identify. It does this all is this all tremor in the same phase? Uh, is the tremor uh, uh, of, of multiple frequencies perhaps? But but there's really a strong coherence between two bands. Uh, that that really could be important down the road as we think about the uh, DBS lead insertion in multiple sites for for multiple tremor generators. And and perhaps you know we won't really be able to determine I think from from EMG uh, that you know you would need to somatotopically place a lead in one area versus another. But it could point to possible DBS resistance to a single target in VIM, a standard target. And uh, the other thing with these patients, safety-wise, is might DBS worsen gait function or dysarthria in patients with a structural CNS lesion or structural damage? And I think for the majority of the patients, unfortunately, there's already so much disease active at that time or, or a degeneration from you know, MS and other, other things that it, you can't really detect it. So uh, dystonic tremor. And this is one of my favorites, really. It's a regular tremor with low frequency, high amplitude, um, often a dystonic posture is present in the limb or, or some other limb, mirror movement, subtle things. There are very subtle things you can do in examination to try and tease out dystonia. And mirror movements are a neat way to do that. You may have a typical uh, looking essential tremor in one area, but they may have you know, some unusual head posture. They may have some toe curling, and you really have to pay attention to that. Uh, the patients won't know to, to, to offer that otherwise. So the, the dilemma here is VM, right? Use the, the same location. Well, uh, they, they get better. Uh, dystonic, people with clear dystonic tremor get, get better with VAM. So I think it's a, a good, good one to use. But they do have breakthrough tremor. Uh, there's other functional aspects. They still have dystonia uh, despite having improvement in tremor. And that can be a, a big, big problem. Um, we don't often see for uh, uh, sites like GPI, though, quite, quite as much tremor control. But, but there are reports of that. 
it's just a patient here. Could you click on the video, please? Let's see, it should play. I don't know how to do it from up here. This is a young guy who has uh, run over on his bike when he was four, and uh, he, he recovered, as kids often do from horrible things like that. But, uh, you know, six to nine months, a year later, he developed abnormal spasm of his left arm. Typical presentation, delayed onset presentation. The history is very important for dystonia. Um, uh, this delayed onset presentation of uh, dystonic spasm. You see this posture of his fingers. Uh, you see a bit of a null point, which uh, is really characteristic of dystonic tremor as he comes closer to his body. It's slightly better, sometimes with more goal-directed activities. The uh, dystonic tremor may worsen, and whereas with cerebellar tremors, outflow tremors, uh, that, that often gets worse. And um, this guy actually didn't get DBS. I was really excited that he might benefit from it, but I started Botoxing him, and he got a lot better. So uh, I think in the long run, patients probably with, with limb symptoms like this that don't respond or get weak will we'll probably go more and more to DBS. And you can see the crushing movement of his hand here. So, so the, just to show you, I, I, I would be—I uh, wouldn't be a movement disorders guy if I didn't show you at least one one video uh, in, the, in the conference. Feel right. So that's my one video, but I've kept it to a minimum. Um, so, uh, should we do the VIM? I mean, it works or other sites. Well, it's it's really a great uh, a treatment, but our great site. But uh, there are other uh, sites that have been investigated, and because they're reported, they all show improvement. So uh, all reported cases show more, show more than 50% improvement. And although I will say 10 cases had no follow-up. So they, were, they didn't show not improvement. But the mean duration of follow-up was 17 months, uh, 6 to 48 uh, average or, uh, range. And then cerebellar outflow tremor. And these are, I think, probably the le least common ones. Uh, SCA, uh, fragile X tremor ataxia syndrome. We've got one of those in cl clinic we're still actively following. Um, and so, again, looking for kind of an endpoint tremor, more of a cerebellar kind of pattern, looking for other cerebellar signs. I mean, use everything at your disposal from the exams, uh, scanning speech and eye movement abnormalities, gait issues that you would expect with cerebellar disease. So when you kind of look at it like that, I, I think this is often easier to diagnose than uh, 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 dystonic tremor. And uh, even for this, there have been several different targets uh, uh, explored. Uh, looking particularly, I think, the po uh, uh, posterior uh, Subthalamic area it seems very interesting because there's bilateral cerebellar afferent fibers uh, coming into that location. And, and it appears, I've not seen this done, but it appears to be a fairly well tolerated site. And then uh, VO, uh, VOP and uh, ZI as well. So, so one of the issues here with these uh, cases is that, you know, these are off-label uh, sites and combinations. And, you know, I, I really uh, think that when these are done, we should try to learn as much about them as possible and publish. And uh, there's unknown potential side effects uh, of, of stimulation in these areas. And if we're, you know, not really following them long-term and reporting on that or at least come up with some more of a standard national register for these, it's hard to know what to do uh, uh, with these patients as we rarely encounter them. And, and then, of course, they all, uh, most patients show improvement, more than 50%. Uh, so I think it's very, very highly likely that there's underreporting of poor results. And it, it does bias us maybe into trying this a little more often than, than, than it's probably right doing. So just the last slide here, uh, questions for the future. So might re return of a GPI, which we've seen, be uh, followed by return of stage surgery in some patients? And I think that uh, it's a bit more of a hassle for the patient. Uh, you know, it's a little delayed gratification for the whole team because we want to get the whole patient better at once. But there's a lot of advantages to doing that. And it's been uh, borne out in literature. Uh, the additional surgical sites I find just endlessly fascinating, uh, you know, uh, how we can individualize uh, the uh, outcome for patients based on their certain phenotype. And this is coming from a pure clinic works perspective without the, uh, the uh, smart uh, yeah, neuroscience uh, uh, supporting it. And, uh, you know, so for example, STN unilateral early with a different disease target for freezing of gait later, M might that be done? I think that would be really interesting. We have a huge need for uh, neuromodulation. I think the neurology community at large really looks at, you know, the, the benefits of neuromodulation is also becoming more keenly aware as these, these patients are living longer of, of the drawbacks on gait and cognition. And, and then, you know, how will we utilize neuromodulation in age of continuous dopamine delivery? And, you know, we've got 12 patients on Duopa now. Four patients on Duopa have DBS, um, uh, and they're all on therapy still. So one patient was had progression to cognitive impairment with some psychosis intraoperative, which was procedure was stopped, and we later did Duopa, and he's doing quite well. Still fine-tuning him. He's proving fairly difficult to get excellent results with Duopa, but it's, it's uh, been helpful. And then three of them, particularly with gait worsening during off and med on 
uh, uh, off med and on stem. And, and this is the problem uh, using uh, or getting peak dose levodopa works in a gate, which has been reported. So the idea of kind of having continuous uh, dopamine delivery, which I think probably with a certain this inherent drawbacks of tubes and whatnot, it really is, is possibly a, a new version of best medical therapy. So thinking about best medical therapy now, some form of continuous dopamine delivery, continuous electrical stimulation, it's really a very powerful thing for patients that otherwise might do very poor. So it's quite, quite fun to think about the future. And then lastly, I wanted to thank my group. I uh, came out to Spokane to work with Dr. Carlson and uh, uh, Jamie Mark as well. And uh, this guy up here, I don't have my wand. Where's my wand? Somewhere. Dr. Hershauer is retiring this month, and he did the first DBS surgery in Washington State in 1997. So I'm uh, really uh, honored to be working with that group um, and, uh, you know, uh, enjoying doing DBS and whatnot. So happy to take any questions.